Good evening, good evening, guys. I uh, hope everyone's well out there, and especially in this crazy day today. Um, I'd like to uh, call a finance committee uh, meeting to order for the Quincy City Council. Uh, before I start, uh, I just want to read in the um, open meeting law uh, addendum, uh, which uh, in accordance with Charlie Baker, March 10, 2020, the order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law in Massachusetts, the Finance Committee of the Quincy City Council is convening via remote conferencing services that are also being aired on Quincy Access Television, Channel 9, Government Access. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Councilor Kane. Present. Councilor Kroll. Present. Councilor DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Councilor Liang. Present. Councilor Mahoney. Present. Councilor Pamucci. Present. Councilor Phelan. Present. Chairman McCarthy. Present. Nine members of the quorum. Thank you. And uh, could I have um, City Clerk uh, Nikki Crispo uh, read the open meeting law? Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any mediums. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present, and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before us this evening are two uh, appropriations. Uh, the first, 2020-047, is a $3 million Broadmeadows Middle School Coastal Phase 1 Coastal Vulnerability Protection and Building Improvements Appropriation. Uh, last Friday, I got out, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Walker and Mr. Hines, uh, for getting me the information, but I put out um, or sent out to you folks three enclosures. One was uh, a very detailed concerning letter uh, by Mr. Hines, the Commissioner of Public Buildings in regards to Broad Meadows, its infrastructure, uh, the pounding that it took two years ago in regards to the water damage um, in, the, in the basement with its boiler, uh, electrical, et cetera. Almost if uh, you could compare it to a, an automobile uh, being submerged in salt water and then trying to get it to work from now on, it's been, um, it's been tough. It's a testament to uh, uh, Mr. Hines and uh, Mr. Segaler also, the school system that they put it together two years ago and they've kept it going. But hopefully everyone, and I won't go through the whole letter, uh, but it did outline um, some big concerns that they have with Broad Meadows and uh, the, um, the request basically to get new heating, cooling, ventilation system, new fire detection system, everything up to code uh, so we can put that building in a place that we don't uh, we don't have those issues happen again. Uh, two weeks ago, I was down at Broad Meadows. We had a 12 foot tide. The water still comes in and the back lawn of Broad Meadows. So it's threatened all the time. So that, that letter was really well put together by Mr. Hines. He also included a complete breakdown of the Broad Meadows to cost estimate uh, that uh, hopefully you folks have been able to go through outlining everything from piping to electrical, excavation, etc. And the last enclosure, of course, is the debt service breakdown that I'm sure Eric will talk to if folks have questions, and so will Mr. Walker. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hines uh, right now to kind of walk us through um, this uh, situation that I think is critical that they have the time uh, this summer to do the work uh, so that Broad Meadows doesn't come offline or we don't have any major problems coming up in the fall winter of 2020. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Hines. Thank you, Chairman McCarthy. Uh, good evening, Councilors and committee members. Um, Councilor uh, McCarthy summed it up pretty well, the situation at Broad Meadows. Um, we're finding now in the current circumstance that we're in in life, of having to find alternative ways to do things. Um, 
unfortunately, one of the things we don't have as a city, an alternative way to do things is what would we do if we lost a school? Um, it would be immensely disruptive uh, to the educational programming. Um, we did just that back in January of 2018, uh, but through uh, complete Herculean efforts with a number of departments and outside agencies and private vendors coming together, we're fortunate that we only lost one day of school, um, but that entailed bringing in emergency generators, emergency boilers, emergency furnaces, and running the building out of the parking lot because the building systems were destroyed. Um, we did, over the ensuing weeks, get the things band-aided back together, uh, kind of MacGyvered a lot of the systems, uh, and got the Marlboro Will again. Uh, we were not at that time able to raise everything above the these uh, flood level uh, because of the nature of the plumbing and the extent of the asbestos uh, contained in that boiler room. Um, so we have crawled and creeped by since then with these symptom, uh, systems, uh, but we're nearing the end of our ability to do that. Uh, compounding this uh, is the fact that about a third of the building uh, and its detail, the cafeteria, the kitchen, the gym, the locker rooms, the auditorium, the media center, is still on the original heating plan for the 1954, I believe it is, uh, well past its intended life expectancy. But worse than that, all the piping is in the crawl space beneath the building. Uh, and that is a toxic environment, not as in chemically, but uh, uh, environmentally. It, it, there's a lot of uh, methane gases and uh, organic uh, occurrences down there. So it's the concrete and everything holds up very well. The building is safe. The building is quite sound. But the systems that are underneath have failed. The hangers that hold the pipes up have rotted out. Pipes are li literally lying on the ground in sections, um, leaking steam and water uh, throughout. Um, so it's not a matter of uh, if. It's a matter of how soon will this fail failure be catastrophic and complete. So uh, given what went on uh, through the CIP, the council uh, and the mayor's efforts, we got funding and we brought in BLW, a uh, renowned uh, mechanical engineering firm that has designed a complete new boiler room two feet above sea level. Uh, it will be within the same space as is the boiler room, but everything's gonna be raised up. They're gonna do a uh, steel platform five feet off of the ground uh, and then raise the mechanicals even higher than that off that platform. Uh, it calls for uh, new piping throughout on that, we call it Building A, it's those five areas that are heated by the original plant. Um, they will now be on a hot water system, brand new and uh, an efficient system. All the asbestos attended to those systems will be abated, as well as the classrooms and the common areas that are, are touched by that phase of the program will have all the accessible uh, asbestos containing building materials removed which would result in new sailings, LED lighting. For that portion of the school, the interior finishes, you'll be like you're walking in a brand new building. Um, the first time ever, the ventilation uh, will actually be functioning. And we're gonna use technology that was used similar to what's in the Central Middle School, where the ventilation system, where you're drawing air out of the building, it has warmth in it. And they use that, that to uh, partially heat the air that you're introducing. Uh, called energy recovery units. Uh, and that also allows you to have conditioning of the air uh, in the warm weather. So it won't be an air conditioned <laughs> building, but it'll be conditioned air. Uh, it's the same system that basically that was installed recently in the construction of the Central Middle School. Um, so in that regard, it'll be a significant improvement uh, for this facility. If you go by there in the summertime, or even I was in there today, teachers have window unit uh, air conditioners in the windows in the classrooms just trying to take uh, the curse off the heat in that building. Um, so it would be a substantial improvement uh, for the learning environment in the building when once this entire project is complete. Uh, the the main electrical system is underneath the building, uh, below floodplain. And that obviously was very difficult for us when we lost that in January. Um, so this project involves uh, bringing in new electrical service from the Yen Grid Pole, transformers, ground-mounted transformers above the floodplain outside of the building, and then feeding new electric into the building, a new switch gear, new um, circuit breakers, and, and new equipment up to today's code, which the building is not. Um, we're gonna have improved emergency lighting. Uh, there's areas of the building without it. 
uh, improved fire alarm system, um, uh, the communication systems, which has, has been impacted, will be restored as well. Uh, and collateral to this, but if, you know, in some degree equally important, um, it is a school. There is quite a bit from that, that phase of building in the 50s and 60s and 70s. There's a lot of asbestos in the building, a number of ceilings and such, that we've taken the opportunity during these recent vacations to take down in limited sections so the engineers can get up and do their measurements and, and uh finalize the designs of what they're proposing to be built. So if you walk in the building now, it's actually already under some degree of construction because of the demolition. Um, but the cafeteria ceiling, which is asbestos, will be gone. The library ceiling, the auditorium ceiling, they all need to go for this project. But independently, they need to go anyways because it's a school and it's asbestos and they're damaged and they need to be taken out. So there's a number of facets of the project, uh, all of which are a benefit to the school community and the educational environment. Thanks, Mr. Hines. Um, questions from my colleagues at all from Mr. Hines. Council Palmucci. Thank you, Chairman McCarthy. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. I do. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul, for um, being here tonight and um, dressing up for the occasion. Um, so the system that was there that was destroyed did you say that was from the 1950s or that the general design was from the 1950s? There's currently two in the two systems, independent systems in the building. Um, back when Honeywell did their work, they repiped half of the building to do a hot water heating system. And there were two boilers that served that hot water system. They went underwater in January, those boilers. Uh, we had to replace them. Once they get wet, you cannot re reuse those. So they had to be replaced. They are still down low. Uh, vulnerable uh, because of the piping in the boiler room. So they, so they, they weren't that old. They weren't that old. I, I guess at that point they were maybe 10, 12 years old, something in that range. Um, the two of the original three steam plant boilers are still there. They're up on, on brick foundations so that the burners, the mechanicals, and the electrical aspects of them went underwater. We replaced all of that in January of 18. But they're a huge monster, like you think of the boiler room of the Titanic, the size of these things, and they're all laden in asbestos. They are still there, and those two boilers are what service those five areas that are still on the original steam plane. You could have said, like, the Queen Elizabeth or something, like a ship that didn't sink, right? I mean, okay. <laughs> a more okay. optimistic view of things, okay. uh, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, the raised platform that you're talking about building now, how high is that? It will be level with the first floor of the main level of the building, which is 18 feet uh, elevation, uh, which is above floodplain currently. Uh, but we're also we're, we're thinking ahead. Uh, whoever follows in our footprints in 40, 50 years, um, we're building the platform, the level, the main level. But then the equipment are going to be two to three feet above that platform. Okay, and this that's exactly exactly what I was driving at is. Um you know, we don't know who's going to be wearing the bow ties in 50 years from now. Um, and I wanted to make sure that we're, I mean, I, re I recall that the, um, uh, the, the Southwest middle school, uh, boiler was the original boiler, right? I mean, right. until we replaced it. So, and that was the 1950s as well. And, you know, do a little math, we're building, you know, our heating systems end up lasting 75 years, 50 to 75 years here. So, we need to be planning for environmental impacts that might occur uh, 50 to 75 years from now. So you think that we're essentially doing the best we can to future proof this from, you know, projected rising sea levels and, and floodplains as best we can in the future? Given the design life of this equipment, the two to three feet above the 18 foot elevation. So 20 foot elevation, 21 foot elevation are sufficient. And in case anyone's confused, the, the height of the ocean, when they say 12 foot tide, 11 foot tide, that is not the same datum as the elevations on land. There's a mm -hmm. correlation, but they're not the same. So I, if I say it's a 20 foot elevation, that doesn't mean we're planning on a 20 foot tide, nowhere near it. Right. Right. Okay. That's the engineers. Right. right. And just um, while I have you, um, kind of unrelated, I, it, sort of related, because I think but, you know, I'm going to vote in favor of this because I think we can't lay down on the job now. We can't be so focused on the on what's 
directly in front of us, which is obviously a monumental task with the public health crisis going on. But we can't lay down on the job now because when we pass through this, which we will, we'll only be creating or leaving a future crisis for us to deal with. Uh, I mean, I don't want to have you and, and the superintendent back before us scrambling to come up with an alternative plan because we can't house uh, children at a school seat. So uh, for that reason, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support this. Uh, but it also begs the question, Paul, have you given any thought to um, what opportunities that this public health crisis uh, in essentially the emptying of our public buildings large, by large, in large part, um, what opportunities that presents us to do any type of work that perhaps, you know, we weren't contemplating, but now that the buildings are empty, that perhaps we should, you know, is there kind of a wish list? Like, like you said, the asbestos with all the breaks, well, you could probably clear asbestos out correct? because there's no kids in the building, right? Yeah. Is there anything else where there's maybe some opportunities that we could do some work um, in uh, the coming weeks or months? There is, there are, and I wish there were more. One example outside of Broad Meadows is the uh, Frenizani School. That, through the council's efforts, supported a new heating system in that building a couple of years back. The pipes of the old system are still in the crawl space. Same thing, they're down in the mud, and there's asbestos on those pipes. So um, we have been directed to remove that asbestos. So that bid is on the street as we speak. I believe it's opening this Thursday. And we plan to get in under that building as soon as that bid is under contract. Uh, there was uh, funding in place for it, and we're hoping to have that done and gone. Uh, and that's something that we're contemplating doing, you know, June 30th forward. We can do it now. It's better to accelerate that. Um, there's work to be done in a lot of the schools. Um, the unfortunate part is when the teachers and students and staff left on Friday, March 16th, in their minds, they were coming back Monday morning, the 19th. Um, their stuff is still on the desk. The classrooms are just still set up. We can't go in now and disturb everything they've got. Those closed classrooms have to be closed up. Um, and what further complicates working in the schools is the current contract situation with the school custodians. Um, they've taken the position, apparently, that they this is a state of emergency for them. Yeah. Um, so if they have called to work, they get comp time. So with uh, the exception of the lunch program schools and two others, uh, the schools are locked down entirely. We can't even go in them, uh, we meaning city employees. Um, so we can't get in there to do some of the work we might otherwise do in the common area, uh, but certainly the classrooms because of, because of the, the challenge with the room still being uh, furnished and, and set up for class instruction. Um, so we don't know when classrooms will be back. Um, I wouldn't presume to know where to put everything back. If we were to pull it apart, do some work and put it back, I'm not going there. <laughs> um, well, I, I appreciate that you're looking at it because I, I obviously it is a unique opportunity where, you know, I keep trying to talk about silver linings with this situation and, you know, yeah. um, they're tough yeah, to find, but, you know, you know, they're tough to find, but we got to try and find them and, you know, make the best we can. So I appreciate you um, being here tonight. If I, if uh, I could, there tonight. There's yes. one more aspect I think there's a lot of people with interest in this one, uh, but it's the locker rooms at the pool at the Lincoln Hancock School. They're, everyone right. agrees it's a deplorable condition. Everyone's asked and been pushing to get those reconditioned. One of the biggest challenges there was when do you shut that down? Because why oh, yeah. they used it, the school uses it, the recreation program uses it. It, it, was, right. just, it was always a good time. But yeah. right now it's closed. And I said, if it's closed now and we close it in five months from now, we look like idiots. Right. Back on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, good. Good for you. So, so what we've done is the architects are already working in that building, designing improvements for there that we hope to implement 2021, 2022. We pull them, bring them back, and say get the locker room design done immediately. And we have on call contractors. So we've actually already started the demolition in the locker rooms. And we're hoping to have 100% complete renovated locker rooms by the time the people walk back in the building. Uh, and that just makes life a whole lot easier for everybody going forward. Yeah, no, that's terrific. I appreciate you uh, looking at those opportunities. And thank you. Um, and like I said, I'll be I'll be voting for this because I think this is these are the steps we have to take so that when life gets back to normal, we can get back to normal um, without a problem. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, the chair recognizes President Liang. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks for dressing up for us, Paul. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you putting a smile on our faces um, with your getup. But I do have a couple of questions for you. So you had mentioned that there was a little bit of work that was done immediately following the storm back in 18. Um, could you just give a summary of the work and funds that have been spent to date since then? Uh, the, the total funding, I'm not prepared right now, but I could get that to you. But uh, it was in the hundreds of thousands. I know that. Um, the two boilers that Honeywell had installed, the hot water boilers, had to be replaced. Uh, we're fortunate that there were two of them on the assembly line for another project somewhere else that they gave to us. Uh, so we were able to get ahead of the, uh, the queue to get those boilers. So we replaced those two boilers. We had to replace the two boilers that heat the domestic hot water, the, the sink faucet uh, water. Uh, we had to put new burners in both of the original steam boilers that were still there and are in service now. Um, we had to replace some floors. We had to replace the uh, transformers under the building, the National Grid transformers, and all of the electrical gear that went underwater, which is every device that operates every motor and every fan in the building. It all had to be removed and replaced. They could not be dried out and reused. Um, the emergency generator had to be replaced. Um, and in, in addition to those physical things, there was the rentals and the, and the components of the two mobile boilers. Um, we, as I think I told you, we even used the services of the fire department to, to fill those boilers. Um, and, and I'm sure there's sundry things, but you know, between the electrical and the, and the mechanical replacements, it, it was substantial. Uh, but again, that work is in the in the transformer room, in the electrical room, in the boiler room. But you know, and we took we took steps to uh, fortify against future flooding. Uh, but you can only hold back the water so long. Um, but uh, the um, the once you leave the boiler room on the other side of the boiler room wall, we didn't do any work on the heating system. That's all the stuff that was underneath the building, still under the building, lying in the mud. Uh, and that's a major component of what's happening in this project going forward. Okay, and then um, I saw in the, in the estimates that you had sent over that we're looking to work, or we got the estimates from a North Bay company. Um, have we worked with them in the past? With whom? The North Bay company who provided the estimates. Uh, I have not used them. Uh, BLW, the engineers that are designing the property, uh, the, the project, they have used them extensively. That's their go-to company. Uh, I did not engage them. Uh, Ken Beck from BLW did. Okay, and how, how many times have you worked with BLW in the past? BLW did the Bernadine School uh, heating plant redesign. Um, they're doing some work right now at Bernadine, additional work. Um, they bid on the work that's happening at uh, Lincoln Hancock School, that design, uh, but we thought it was a better fit for another company because Lincoln Hancock is exclusively... Um, electrically done it's electric heat and everything uh and a big component of the lincoln hancock was the swimming pool and the mechanicals and the filtration system for that uh mm -hmm. and the other firm had more expertise we felt uh in that world um but you know dave scott in uh, in my department my hvac guru he has worked in the past he speaks highly of them uh this he itself had a great experience with them on the uh the bernazani project okay Great. And then do we have, um, I know that I saw a built-in contingency with our estimates with the North Bay company, but do we have our own contingencies built in, whether it's with staff that is going to be, you know, pulled over from your office or any timelines or, or any um, or any financing on our end with that? Uh, we haven't provided any in-house because we anticipate it would be done regular hours, not off hours. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually having a conversation now whether we ought to have uh, an OPM on this one. Uh, whose sole Did focus would be on say this, what an OPM is for me? An, an owner's project manager, uh, kind of a clerk of the works. Um, mm -hmm. So when we do, for instance, we've done the, uh, the MSBA boiler room replacement projects. Uh, we used to use the firm there. Um, MSBA requires it, uh, but it proves out uh, to save you money in the long run because you keep the contractor's hand uh, on the wrench. There's, you, you don't have gaps of, of downtime. Uh, and there's always someone, the OPM acts to look over their shoulders and make sure they've ordered the long lead time equipment, uh, that they're planning for other contingencies. Um, you know, we've got professionals in my department, they do their things, but we have a department to run in 50 something other buildings to tend to. Um, 
So on, on a major project like this construction, uh, we are ourselves taking a step and a hard look whether we should manage it in-house or bring in a part-time OPM. And that would be a contractual basis. Uh, and I, I really feel that if we do that, uh, the efficiencies on the construction aspect uh, basically would pay your uh, the cost of the OPM. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then what is the timeline that we are looking at for this? This is multiple year. Um, the repiping and the re the hundred percent new system for the, the the auditorium, the cafeteria, the gym, the library, and the hundred percent of the boiler room uh, will be done for fall of twenty twenty. Um, the other half of the building, the administrative half of the building, and the other academic wing of the building would be uh, what improvements we later decide to do and later fund uh, would be summer 2021, and uh, likely the crawl space would be summer 2022, if not 2021. So it's a multiple year project. Uh, mm-hmm. The large building is a large undertaking, uh, and we do, we can't you know we can't shut the building down. We have to work around the academic calendar. Yeah, I mean, so, but all of the finance, even though the work is going to be done sporadically, all the financing is looking to get approved now. Um, and from what I can tell, maybe Eric can answer this, um, with the, the debt service for this, um, it looks like we are going to start paying principal on it in 2023 and just paying interest on it in the interim. I, between that and the work that's getting done, I'm just trying to get an understanding of what is necessary for the work and what is necessary for the financing that we can get by with right now. Because you know, to Council Primary's point, that there's critical work that we cannot ignore. I mean, you know, yes, there's what's in front of us right now, and I certainly um, want to be sensitive to that, but we also need to be mindful of, you know, making sure that we are providing the best services for our, our residents, including, you know, more importantly, the kids who are going to these schools, right? So, but to that end, we are also facing a financial crisis with everything that's been going on. And so I just, you know, both of those things are something that I'm thinking about. Um, very carefully right now and i just want to be mindful about how much work is getting done um in the sort of immediate term and how much we can manage um you know in conjunction with these engineers and in conjunction with north bay contracting um, and how much of that funding really needs to get put through right now so you know i'm just trying to get an understanding of if the work is going to happen over the next year and a half you know how much of this funding do we really need to put up front now versus you know sort of doing this um on a rolling basis with the work as it gets done so I don't know if that's something you can answer or something I can answer and maybe both of you can jump in on, but yeah. that would be helpful to understand that. I can take the first half and then certainly I wouldn't suppose to know what Eric would follow with, but um, the $3 million ask is for the work that's happening in summer of 2020 and the fall of 2020. Uh, the work for 2021 and beyond uh, is not part of tonight's ask. That would be uh, a separate conversation down the road for other phases, for other aspects that would be funded when that conversation happens. But the $3 million ask is the, the boiler room, 100% new boiler room, the new electrical system, and um, you know the, those, the four classrooms above the cafeteria, the cafe, the auditorium, the library, and the gym. So the $3 million is for this year's this work. So what is the project cost in totality then with everything that you're projecting out for the work next year? That contract is scoping in. That cost estimate, I believe, is just under $8 million. Uh, okay. Ken Beck from BLW, myself, and and Dave have had meetings on that. We think that's that's a, a high estimate. Um, they generally do do that to cover their own tail in case there's an escalation. Sure. Uh, and there's you know to some degree there's some work in there that we on those later phases that we could put off to another time. Um, so it doesn't have, you know God forbid it takes years to come out of what we're spiraling into. Um, that can, there's, there's phases of that that could be postponed. Um, okay, so the later all. phases then for the remaining eight million, that's not the urgency, right? The urgency that it sounds like is in the boiler room, the electrical and the classrooms right now. At this point, that rough estimate, the totality is eight million. Mm-hmm. So it's three million yeah. now and, and five plus going forward. Yeah. So the three okay. million now is the boiler room, the electric and the, and the, the area I described uh, for the summer 2020 work. Okay, and do you see that, um, I mean, it's hard to predict, I guess, with everything that's going on. We don't know when we're going to start getting back to it. Um, but as of right now, you, in, again, in conjunction with BLW and, and North Bay, you are slated to look to start this summer with that work. Yes. Okay. All right, Eric, do you have any other information you can add to that? Um, the, the work, the actual, the demolition work and stuff that has to happen first, the abatement work. Um, mm-hmm. The abatement work was put out to contract that's been awarded. 
Uh, the demolition work is going to be done with our on-call contractors. Um, but because of the expected dollar amount on the construction of the new boiler room and the, and the new electrical system, uh, we had conversations with Catherine Hoban, uh, purchasing director, and we feel we'll get a better price if we go to the street and bid the, the new boiler room construction and the new electric system. So the part of BLW's work was to design it all, but also to prepare the bid package. Uh, that's going to print uh, publication in the Central Register for this Thursday ago, and it'll be published next week. So two weeks after that, that bid would be open. So it's going to be a full mm -hmm. uh, public bid process. Uh, we're not asking for waivers. We're not asking for emergency uh, considerations. Um, and we're hoping to get uh, good pricing on that. Um, and so, and one of the reasons that we're, we're, we're forging ahead now uh, in, in April on this um, is that a lot of this equipment, the boilers and the different equipment have long lead times. So if we wait till May or June to have this conversation on the funding and then bid it, not only we lost valuable time, we may not have enough time to build before the fall, but we certainly would have very, very difficult time getting the equipment that we need. Uh, the other aspect of it is a lot of the, the conventional wisdom and the people out on the streets is that once the stay-at-home orders are relaxed and once all building and such uh, comes back online uh, across the board construction, there's going to be an absolute crush to get contractors and materials. Uh, so we are the, the path that we're following gets us out of, ahead of that, it leads ahead of that, so that we're in place and we're in the front of that queue to get that equipment and to get those materials and get that, that labor force. Okay, so the bidding process right now that you're looking to have done or the whole timeline that you're looking to have done right now is get this approved um, for the work in the boiler room, the electrical in the classrooms, put it out to bid, and then hopefully have a start date in this summer to actually hit the ground on it. Yes, uh, as, as okay. soon as the building's available to us, we want to go in. Uh, and and okay. that's why you know we've advanced the work that we have to date. Okay. Thank you. Um, Eric, I'm going to go back to you for a second. Do you have any other additional information you can add to that for the financing piece of it? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think Paul did a great job covering it. Um, it's just from our uh, standpoint, the borrowing authority is, allows us, is what allows us to sign the contract um, that we can certify that we have funds available. Uh, so, you know, there's maybe some, if there's a desire to piece it out, it can actually jam up and end up costing more in the long run as Paul bids out this process. That's all I really have mm -hmm. to add to it. I think Paul did a great job. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, thanks, Paul, and, and thanks, Eric. I'd like to recognize that uh, Councilor Kane right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, to Eric, uh, give me some numbers then. What would it cost us to split those two up over the long run, as you say? All right, so if we try, the first issue that comes up is that we try and split this out. And it ends up being, you know, coming in at $3 million as expected. And we say we did 1.5. We wouldn't be able to certify we have enough funds to actually sign the contract. Um, so if we try to piece, what, piece that out into two separate bids, um, you kind of have to redo all the soft costs over again. Um, Paul can probably give me a better estimate on this. But generally speaking, a project like this has 10 to 15% soft costs. Uh, so if you do that twice, you'd be looking to add an additional about one hundred eighty to $210,000. Over what period of time? I would probably only change it by about a year. So you'd almost pay enough, what our current debt service is going to be on this bond. You probably end up having to pay just a whole another year on it just Eric, by doing that. Eric, much. Eric, can I jump in for a minute? Yep. I, I, I'm getting confused here. So I think, unless I'm wrong, the ask is, can we spread out the $3 million sale of bonds rather than sell out $3 million up front? We're not talking about the other $5 million at this time, which would be a year from now. We're talking, you know, project and funds and completion by fall 2020. So it, it wouldn't be a year, year and a half out. So if you're doing two tranches of bond sales, you know, you know, we, we do one bid for the job. We can't split the bid. It's three million. It's three million. Yeah. Like, we couldn't do a million and a half, a million and a half, because if you got a different contractor that won the second half of his job, when one contractor got its half done, that is a complete nightmare, and it would never happen. Yeah, so that's what I was from the one from the memo from the that's memo, Commissioner Hines, the memo that you put forward, it seems to represent that this project could be done in two different phases, 
And so, you know, while I'm all for getting work done when the time is right, especially when uh, the school uh, apparently needs it, uh, I'm not looking at uh, going back to normal as a thing. I don't think there is a normal uh, once the situation is over. And I think, you know, one thing that would be great to have, I think we're waiting on some information for some financial forecasts um, because, you know, I my personal belief, I just get an email, you know, I get emails all day long about what's going to happen to state and local tax receipts uh, after something like this happens. And so I just want to be sure that, uh, one, uh, I have an understanding of, of what our projections are going to look like. And we're not, you know, walking into a financial disaster when the world has been shut down. You know, we're, we're not necessarily sure what uh, the economic outlook is going to is going to be uh, following this situation. And um, I guess on the other hand, I also would like to know then what are some other sort of priorities or critical work that might be coming down the line? Uh, because I think, you know, this is the point where it comes to making financial decisions. What is, is my colleague Noel DeBono always says, what are the needs and what are the wants? And so is this one of those, is this, you know, an absolute need is, you know, what, what are the critical items here? I mean, this, this is the time I think we should be making very difficult decisions. So, um, and I don't know, Paul, I, I understand where you're sitting, where you're, you're trying to do your, your part of the job. Uh, but I think uh, probably Mr. Walker and Mr. Mason have a better holistic outlook on what we're looking at. Uh, one, from a financial forecast perspective, and two, from uh, financial requests that would be coming down the line soon. Through you, Mr. Chairman, if I can. Yes, Mr. Walker. Thank you. Um, this is broken up, Councillor, uh, between the three million and the eight million. Uh, for that very reason, this three million dollars, as it's been described, uh, is not something that we would categorize as a want. This is a need. Um, that system is failing, as, as Commissioner Hines described. Uh, this is one of those projects, uh, regardless of the city's financial position and what we may or may not be facing in the coming months, um, we would move forward on. Uh, if the bottom fell out, uh, this is a project, at least this 3 million piece of it, I, I understand that the second and third phases, maybe as we as we do look at those priorities, those, those can be altered, but this 3 million, and that's why we're before you now, uh, is that this project absolutely, this phase of it has to go forward and has to get done in a timely manner. From a bigger picture, I've spoken to, to President Liang and a, and a few colleagues relative to the forecasting and what we're seeing uh, and being ready to have a deeper discussion on that. Um, I know I spoke last week about that. Uh, it didn't take long on Tuesday, uh, a long discussion to figure out that we're not, we're not ready. Uh, the state's not ready. The federal government's not ready uh, to have a, a detailed breakdown of what we may or may not be looking at in the coming months. Um, the reason for that is they still don't know at the state level. We had a call on Friday uh, with the commissioner of the D of DOR, uh, and they didn't have any sense yet. Uh, the, the conventional wisdom right now is it's just too soon to make any determinations, either optimistically or pessimistically. So as opposed to getting out in front of this and coming in with a, a forecast of a worst case scenario or a best case scenario, um, we're going to take some time and figure out what the actual scenario is going to be. And, and to that end, we may, we've talked internally about pushing off uh, the submittal of the 2021 budget to a little bit later in May to give us and give you a little bit more time to deal with the facts of the ground as they become clearer. But right now, there's just not a lot that's becoming clearer. Um, and, that's, and that's not a criticism of anyone. That's not anything that, that anyone's done wrong. That's just the, the basis of it. everyone's in the middle of this right now. Um, and it's, it's, there's not a lot of basis to make a determination as to what the city may face. Now, all that being said, I'll just repeat what I said originally, that we wouldn't be going forward with this 3 million uh, request if there was any indication that this, is, that this is not something that we need to do and we need to do right away. Um, the rest of this project, yes, that can wait. But this, regardless, if we end up a worst case scenario and we have to do major cutbacks to provide uh, major cutbacks to the services the city provides, which is the exact opposite of what the mayor is going to try to do. Uh, but if that eventuality happens, 
uh, this is not a project that would be included among those things that, that waits. This would go forward. It would have to. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand that this is, I just want to be sure that, you know, I mean, because you, you know, ostensibly we could keep kind of doing this right where we've got another critical project, critical project. Um, so I, I just want to understand if there's anything else coming our way in the near term before we have an understanding of a financial forecast for the city, you know, no, that is going to be defined as critical in nature. No, through, through you again, Mr. Chairman, no. Uh, for the purposes of this, for the purposes of going forward in the immediate term, uh, this is critical, um, and everything else is pretty much being looked at in terms of that bigger picture. As to as as Council DeBona and you have mentioned, the needs versus the wants. Um, we have a lot of needs, and, and I'm not going to sit here and suggest that there's not going to be items that come down the pipeline. But everything uh, is going to be baked in to a much bigger picture uh, relative to what the facts on the ground suggest. We are gonna take a look at some of the things um, that are, will be coming before you, perhaps coming before you and determine what can go and what can't. Um, there's gonna probably be some tough decisions that need to be made before we come to this body uh, relative to some further spending requests. But yeah. Commissioner Hines has made it abundantly clear that this isn't one that can wait. Okay. Um, I appreciate the clarification and uh, thanks to everyone for providing information, Mr. Hines and Mr. Mason. Back to you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Kane. Uh, great, great points. Um, really great points. And, and I've had my conversations with Mr. Walker uh, in regards to that same point of what was coming down the road and uh, having a middle school that was in this much bad shape infrastructure wise would probably be scrambling um, to try to get it up and running if we didn't go forward. But thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Councillor Kroll, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good to see everybody. I'm glad, uh, glad we're all safe. Um, thank you for the, uh, I guess, commentary this evening. Much to Councillor Kane's point, I was initially sort of struggling to look at this as a presentation outside of like part A and part B. Um, but I guess now my understanding is the $3 million is essentially for this tranche, for lack of a better word, of the uh, of the project. <clears throat> and um, Council MacArthur, I remember when you were first coming in, uh, you know, the hand that you had dealt with all of the stuff that happened on the neck was absolutely incredible. And I remember quite vividly when uh, when the issue happened down at Bob Meadows with respect to the boilers. and. Um, you know, I'm all for investing into, um, into public facilities, particularly schools. Um, you know, the challenge that I've, I've faced over the last couple of days was, and Mr. Walker has alluded to it a little bit, uh, we put forward a resolution actually one week ago today on April 6th um, for that financial update. And, you know, without running the risk of regurgitating what was shared here this evening. Uh, look, this is an unprecedented time uh, in the economy, in the nation. And to try to grasp, in a sense, what we may or may not be dealing with, I think, in my opinion, is, uh, is mission critical. I know that there's a lot of uh, variables. Um, you know, I work, obviously, in the stock market, and <laughs> I've seen the variables on, on a daily basis. But, um, you know, getting that financial forecast and just sort of like where we're at. And I know we spoke about here with capital asset planning and, you know, obviously at this point, prioritization. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of money in motion for, uh, for various projects. So for this city council, I know it's, uh, again, mission critical to get the full understanding where we're at because um, – with this particular project, we are funding it through uh, the issuance of bonds, which is different than, you know, using other financial um, mechanisms, which we'll speak about on the next appropriation. So, again, I can't, and I spoke with uh, Mr. Walker as well, like there's very few times that I stress sense of urgency up here um, with respect to a lot of things, but this, where we're at right now, I think we really need to get our head around it because... You know, I mean, through nobody's fault, revenues will be off. That's a fact. 
And then it will come down to, you know, as Council Cannon alluded to, some tough decisions along the way to figure out how we make up those uh, those shortfalls. Um, through you to Mr. Hines, I was just curious because, you know, again, I had done my homework on, on preparing for the meeting and just trying to understand, you know, when you talk about the potential collaboration with the city and national grid to potentially, I'm assuming, allow us to opt into the math save program and potentially offset costs like where are we at in terms of that conversation that's at its infancy because for the most part their national grid's participation would be on the, the relighting with the led lighting and with the motor starters and such for the uh for the fans uh that stuff that's more of the phase two as opposed to the boiler room work um which and, and those limited academic spaces we spoke to um and they they're they're phase one um the lighting impacted by the phase one work uh we anticipate having the fixtures delivered to us for free uh through the incentives given by national grid uh, but that is a different program than is their physical participation in the rest of the building uh, part of part of the national grid piece here too uh is the transformers they own them they will be funding that aspect of the project, the replacement of the transformers. Uh, we own from the transformer into the building. They own from the pole to the transformer. Um, and that's going to be a sizable cost in, in this endeavor. Uh, they basically have to excavate from the telephone poles all the way to the back of the school by the gym door. So that's that's going to be a big ticket that uh, they'll be picking up the cost of. Understood. Um, again, where I'm challenged is. You know, we put forward a resolution to get that update. I mentioned to you know the chairman uh, possible the, the possibility of having a presentation. Um, you know, maybe considering the item at a later date after we have the overall financial discussion. I'm not sure what the will is there, but I will just put something out as um, you know. Again, we're in a very unique situation when we think about uh, revenues. And that, um, you know, we're talking about three million bucks, but we're really talking about four and a half million when you consider the interest, because that's part of, you know, that's part of the rub. Um, you know, I don't know, again, the city council's job is not to necessarily, oh, we can advocate, but it's sometimes, most times we can't implement, but I would put it out there just for the sake of contemplation. And again, we can't institute this, but I think, uh -huh. Consider where we are economically. You know, this is an opportunity to take, uh, you know, a large portion of the free cash, which has to be spent essentially by June 30th, sitting on the sidelines, which I believe is in the amount of uh, north of two million dollars, and use it to augment part of this financing. Um, again, I can't really, I can't really say that that's the best thing to do because we haven't seen an overall download on the city's finances, but I really think we need to get creative in this environment. And uh, with that, I appreciate you letting me share, Council McCarthy. Again, I think this is, uh, you know, it's a very noble cause. Who doesn't want to replace and upgrade the boilers and the HVAC systems, um, as well as the electrical system? I mean, those are basic meat and potato items. I'm just struggling with the fact of we don't have a we don't have or I don't have much of any understanding as to like where we're at financially or where we're heading. Um, and I know, you know, to a great extent, it's a gray area, but uh, I'd like to have a little more comfort as far as that goes. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Council Mahoney. Thank you. Um, I'm going to apologize because I'm having some internet connection problems, so I'm not sure if I'm going to go in and out, but I've been missing. Oh. I lose you. I think so. Uh, Mr. Hines, could you just tell me about it? Like, but when we're talking about the building, Part B building, and could you tell me what we'll end up with with the auditorium? Cafe, kitchen, library, classrooms, gym, locker rooms. What what are we anticipating the end result to be? Other than we'll have a full upgrade to our electrical systems and a full upgrade to our boiler room replacements. So, what will be the vision of what this will all look like? Okay, um, the vision will be is because of the impacted interior surfaces, the ceilings in those areas will be new. 
the asbestos ceilings will be gone. The asbestos floor tiles will be gone. The asbestos pipe insulation will be gone. There'll be new ceilings, new lighting, LED lighting, new paint jobs, new tile floors. Um, in addition, this isn't just the heating and, and, air, and uh, ventilation we spoke of. It's also the plumbing system. Parts of that building right now are, are served by plastic piping carrying the water. It's not up to code and it's not permanent and it can fail at any time. Okay, you're breaking up. <laughs> okay. Um, it's uh, saying, suggesting that it's the plumbing system as well. So it's not just the HVAC. Parts of the building are served by plastic piping. It does not meet code and can and will fail. So this is the, the plumbing system as well. So these are absolutely critical. We speak when, did of, the, when did the plastic piping, when did the plastic piping go in? Because plastic is it, it's not relatively new. It wasn't done in 1950. No, it, it, it's post storm. We got a waiver from the plumbing inspector to allow us to put the piping in in anticipation of replacing all the copper. The plumbing system is in the crawl space as well. The water service of that plumbing system is lying in the mud and, and that leaks. So we were able to get a waiver to run the plastic piping in the building to give water throughout the building, but on a temporary basis with the waiver from the plumbing inspector. So we will, you know, we speak to needs and wants I've heard. And if I could respectfully add one, there's half dues, there's needs and there's wants. This one's absolutely a have to. Um, it, it's not just we're going for energy efficiency upgrades. We are, if, if we don't do this work, we're in absolute and serious danger of not being able to Again, heat this building. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm sorry, you did break up and I, I know what you said was valuable. I, I do struggle with this because, um, and I struggle, not that we need to do this, but I struggle with the fact of the timing of when this is coming before us and none of us saw, you know, the pandemic. So that's not by any means your fault, Paul, but it is where we're at right now. My disappointment is, and I'm hoping you that everyone can hear this, that is that we asked for a financial update. And I understand that the administration and Mr. Walker, you're saying that you don't have the forecast from the state or the federal government, but we do know what we're doing here in the city of Quincy. And we could simply make an assessment as to what is a need and what is a want at this point. What can we put on hold and how can we move forward? Because we do know there's gonna be major impacts to our city financially because of this, this pandemic. And, and to have this before us, not call can have financial view of the city and understanding of what we're going to be able to move forward to and what we can hold as a as a, as maybe a future need to be able to get our arms around before we talk about this puts it puts everybody in a very difficult situation and because of that it's going to be very hard for me to approve if this is something we're going to be asked to approve tonight before we have that financial review now i don't want to wait until june or may the late may or june for when the state it's going to come back or when our budget's going to be done i'd like to know what our status is today as a city with these other variables that we don't have into play, which we can actually forecast ourselves. Mr. Mason could help us do that as well. My concern is that we're gonna go ahead with something and potentially, you know, we we could break this out. Is there any chance with, the, this is a question for you, Paul, is there any chance that minimize some of the, um, some of the costs that we have in this still get still get what we need accomplished, but minimize some of the cost maybe to some of the um, materials that we're using or anything to make the cost go from three million dollars to a little more palatable price. Um, the none of the materials that we're using are uh, Trumponian. Uh, it's vinyl floor tile. It's standard two by two ceiling tiles. It's you know stock grade lighting fixtures. Uh, we're, we're not doing a Taj Mahal. Um, it, it's It'll be attractive, it'll be clean, it'll be new, it'll be up to date, it will be code compliant, but it's not it's not over the top in the in the materials of the finishes. Uh, and again, I, I wholly respect the, res the responsibility that the council has for the funding and, and the forecast and, and the across the board for the city, but we cannot not do this job respectfully. I'm not saying that we don't do this appropriation. This presentation impacts 
of where we stand today. Because my concern is, is that we need to understand as a council and as a city, what our priorities are and this one being it, but we also have to have an understanding as to what the financials are, which was asked at the last meeting and was, and it was also asked if we have enough time to be able to put that presentation together for this evening. And we did not. So I'm concerned about that. Had we done that, we would be able to have this conversation as well, but we don't. So to ask to vote for something like this tonight and then have that presentation puts us at a disservice. We budgeted this out over over a timeline, much like we did for the police station. But I noticed that we didn't include the police station at that. So there's going to be some high years there too. Are we anticipating in that budget that you pushed out for the bond the anticipation of loss in revenues from fees, loss in revenues from from the economic economic downturn? Mr. Mayor, Council, if that's addressed to me, you cut out. Okay. So, so my question is, is, is in the presentation that you gave us, you did a, you did a bond kind of a forecasting of that bond. Were you taking into consideration the pandemic and the economic transition that we're having with loss of fees and loss of income from different, different things over the course of time, or is it just a straight timeline for your. Uh, Council, are you referring to the package given to you by uh, Mr. Walker? I, yeah, I believe I don't have. Because that's not a forecast. That's just a bond. And that's just an outline of what the bond looks like. There's no revenue side of it. So there's no revenue side of that. So, so that's would, not how that's modeled. So would you? So would you? So you did that for the police station for us, where you bought, you showed us a forecast for that. Would you yes. be able to do the same thing with this, anticipating some of the challenges that we're going to have? Yes, but and I will say. That, with it, would you include that with all of the other bonds that we currently have, so that we can see that impact? That's what was included with the police station. One of the issues you're gonna have with what that graph looks like is called materialism, which is the idea that this line, the difference between what the line looks like and what the, this line looks like are gonna be almost identical. Currently, this represents a 0.00648% increase of overall debt load to the city budget. Okay, you cut out. Okay, so I currently- what you said, Mr. Mason. Yes, it looks, uh, currently, this represents a 0.00648% uh, addition on top of the budget, which in terms of showing that on a, on a graph, will make the lines be right over themselves. And that's anticipating, and that's anticipating the forecast being, though, then if you bring in revenues to be able to show what the revenue side is for the city. Well, you're, you're, you're talking about two different things. You're talking about debt service, which is an expense, and then you're talking about uh, an, an assumed reduction in, exp in revenue. When I showed the public safety model, there was no revenue projection in there. It's merely the expense side of the equation. Mrs. <clears throat> Mrs. Mahoney, I think we're going to, um, we'll hold off for, we'll come right back to you, but um, I'm going to uh, uh, turn it back over to um, President Liang to uh, open up the regular meeting and then come back to the finance, if that's okay with everyone. It's almost 6.30. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we're going to go ahead and roll right into just um, opening up the council meeting and then closing it out. And uh, Mr. Chairman, going right back to you. So um, with that, we are um, going to go ahead. And uh, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Madam Clerk Kane. <clears throat> council Kroll. Present. Council DeBona. Present. Council Harris. Present. Council Mahoney. Present. Council McCarthy. Present. Council Palmucci. Present. Council Phelan. Present. President Liang. Present. Nine members, you have a quorum. Thank you. If we could all just stop um, for all of you who are coming in as well, and just take a moment of silence for all those who are serving here and abroad. Thank you. And just given our current situation, um, if my colleagues will have you, I'm going to waive the pledge. But I would like to take an additional, good luck to you, Counselor, uh, an additional moment of silence for all of those who are serving on the front lines during this pandemic. Thank you, everyone. Madam Clerk, could you read the open meeting law, please? 
Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present, and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Thank you. And in accordance with Governor Charles D. Baker's March 10th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20, the Quincy City Council is holding this City Council meeting via remote conferencing services and it is being aired on Quincy Access Television, QATV, channel QATV-9 Government Access. With that, we will close out the Council meeting for now um, and go back to Finance Committee, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, yeah, I'd like to reopen the uh, Finance Committee uh, April 13th and uh, go back to uh, Council Mahoney. <clears throat> Dave, can you hear me? Yeah, I can now. Okay. Um, so I actually forgot where I left off, but I, but in 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 general, what I was trying to say is that we we really do need a presentation from the city to understand the where we are today as a city with all of the changes that we've had in the last five weeks with um, with this. And also, we don't, we don't necessarily need everything from the state or the federal government to be able to tell us that we are headed into um, tricky financial territory. The, the, the number of layoffs that we're seeing, um, both in Massachusetts and throughout the whole country is telling us that we're headed into a, a, into a time where we have to be extremely careful about how we're moving forward. And I do realize that this is a critical project, but I must put on hold. I'm being asked to be on hold until we have to see an understanding as a finance chair. Are we moving to have a, a vote tonight on this, or are we moving to just have an information of it tonight? I think I, it came in muffled, but I would love to have a vote on it tonight. I'm um, just as concerned as yourself and Councillor Crow, but we're talking about a middle school that is in tough shape in regards to its infrastructure. Um, I don't know how Mr. Hines and company held it together, um, but it is one of those things that it's a middle school, uh, not a park, not a swimming pool. Um, it, it is a necessity. And so that's why I, I'd like to move on this tonight. I understand that it is a lot, um, it is a necessity, but there's a lot of other projects that are going on in the city at the current time in process that we could go back and look at to reassess the val validity of those projects as they stand now, and then be able to put those things forward. And without that financial conversation and actually that financial forecast of where we stand as a city, it is not beneficial for us to move ahead with anything. I really do think the assessment would really, um, warn everybody be, to be careful about approving for the city. This is already I'm, you, I'm have losing to move forward with. you have to have an understanding of where you stand today and how you're going to be able to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mahoney. Uh, Councilor Phelan, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a question, and I'm not sure we could run it by. Can we get reimbursed on this from the state school building fund? If I may, Mr. Uh, Chairman, through you, Mr. Paul Hines, my counselor. Um, yes, we go, Mr. Hines. In the days following the floods in January and March of 2018, we did file an emergency statement of interest with the MSBA, and we were invited in to participate uh, for that. Uh, emergency statement of interest for the purposes of uh, Broad Meadows. Uh, when we looked into it and what benefits were available to us, uh, the replacement, the long-term replacement of the boiler room was not available to us um, under that emergency program. It was intended to get a building back up and occupied uh, and functioning uh, and to our credit, but I guess to our detriment, we had done that. Uh, so looking at what was available to us, it was not a great benefit to us. And having accepted any money under that program would require us to have full insurance on the building forever. 
Uh, and the city of Quincy, like most municipalities in Massachusetts, are self, uh, self-funded on their insurances. We would have had to buy a commercial policy, uh, the cost of which was substantial and would have been an annually recurring mandatory expense. So in conversation with the mayor's office, we opted uh, not to participate uh, for that limited, very limited benefit we would have received at the time. Uh, and that program only would have done uh, the boiler room. It would not have done uh, the work that needs to be done outside of that room, uh, and it would not include the electrical system. Okay, so basically with there's no, no uh, reimbursement from the state on this, this is something we have to handle on our own. Correct. Um, you know, I, I've been around when, when we lost the building, and it was a middle school, it was Central Middle School, I was on the city council when we lost the building. We had a third less kids than we do now in the, in the school system. And we were able to fit them in nooks and crannies. We don't have space anymore. And um, whether we're gonna have a Northeaster or this fall or winter, we could still have one now. Um, when you try to move that many kids around, it's virtually impossible. And it will cost you more money than the $3 million we're spending today to try to set up emergency classrooms. I, I've been in that position before. I saw us basically open up our wallet and just throwing the money out because we had to, to get the kids, to keep the kids in school. Middle school, a lot of kids there. Um, I think this is absolutely necessary and um, I'm gonna support voting on this. I realize that we're in a crisis and there's no question. We've always been in a crisis. We had Central Middle School go right after uh, Black, was, I believe it was uh, Black, Black Friday. Yeah. And uh, we, we, we were going through a very similar, but we had to fix the building. Um, this is unprecedented what we're going through, but that was a pretty bad time back then too. And we didn't have any cash reserves in the city. And, but we, yeah, we had to keep, keep, keep the schools open. That's part of what we do. So I think this is, uh, I've been in the building when the flooding happened, I saw the fish swimming through the basement there. A uh, lot of problems if that happens again and we lose the building. And I, I, I understand the concerns and I have the same concerns, but I think this is, uh, I'd almost put it in as an emergency that this has to be done. Because if we lose this building, the crisis that will come afterwards and what we have to do to get those kids into a school building, um, it is, is, can be monumental. And it was able to be done back then because we had a third less kids in the schools. Now the schools are at capacity and it would be impossible to find Rome to house another a whole middle school. So um, I'm gonna support um, the, 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 the Broad Meadows uh, phase one project because they think we have to. We're, we're in reality, the earth is warming. We had sea rise is happening, it's real. We saw it on 2018 when it happened. So I'm supporting this measure tonight and uh, I think it's pay me now or pay me later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Phelan. Uh, I'd like to recognize that uh, Council DeBona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, just for a point of information, uh, at 540, the power came back on in Ward 1. And I put the lantern away. So thank you so much. It's always back on Ward One. Um, just a couple questions for, uh, and I want to thank my colleagues for um, asking a lot of questions that I had. Thank you. Um, this is for uh, through you to Mr. Mason. Um, we're talking a lot about financials and what we foresee for the future and, and the uncertainty of all of, of bonding in general or the budget in general. Where are we on short-term ratio bonding? and long-term overall, what is our percentages on those right now as we speak? Well, um, as the city always does, we keep an open line of communication with Cinder, uh, who greatly serves as his financial advisor. Um, the bond market, the band market, so your bond anticipation notes, um, it's pretty much status quo. We've seen percentages for our type of debt going out about one, 2%, somewhere in that range. Uh, long-term, it's still to be foreseen what that market's gonna turn out. It seems like a lot of investors are hesitant. So there's not really a market rate going right now. Um, unfortunately, we like to talk a lot about modeling. Um, the last time we saw a pandemic like this was 1918, which is actually before John Maynard Keynes even theorized ma macroeconomics. So to talk about there's some model that we can all look at, we're, the state, local, 
federal government, private economists, think tank economists, we're all in the same boat. We're waiting for the data to gather up. We simply, this has never happened before. You can't model something that hasn't happened. So that's why I think a lot of these firms are hesitant, hesitant for long-term uh, uh, bonds. But it does seem, though, uh, with the recent Fed talk, that this is going to go back to status quo. That's why you'll see in the model, we use a 4% interest rate, which is considered a very conservative interest rate. Very unlikely to see AA uh, plus stable outlook bonds going at 4% many times. And Eric, if I can ask you a little bit more about what are we as a, as a municipality, as Quincy, where are we our percentages wise? I think we were, we, we had some bonding um, room, obviously, in the last few years where it's been very aggressive. But what, what are we at overall as a city on the short term um, bonds and our, our long term bonding overall? So overall, um, we're about, we're actually about average with the state if you divide up for population, the amount of capital we do. Um, there's a uh, last CIP we, uh, that was approved. Um, part of that financial package was talking about the debt rolling off. So nothing has really changed in terms of that debt rolling off. Um, so our ratios have maintained about, about the same. There's a, a small short-term interest spike that's occurred over the last couple of fiscal years. That's largely due to the to the dip, not to the general fund. Okay. And do you anticipate? Um, and we obviously don't know the market, Eric, and I, I know you're talking micro and macro, and I, I took those economic classes back in college, but uh, do you anticipate a refi boom of helping out the economy by refinancing any long-term debt? Um, do, you, do you anticipate any of that happening? Um, I think it's foreseeable. I think one of the things with Quincy being in such a strong uh, position with our credit rating, uh, it's always better to let the guys who have more to gain the lower rated bonds to test that market for us. I think uh, if Quincy, Quincy, because of it, we're in the position we are in, we can take a safer approach. Um, so it could be, again, we don't really have any models to look at because the last time this happened was over 100 years ago. Uh, so there's this long-term data to look at. Uh, but I, it's something I could definitely foresee, Council, I'll say that. Uh, but I think it's more, I, I think given Quincy's superior debt position and superior credit rating, that it's better to let the, the less fortunate uh, in terms of credit rating you know, test that market before we do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Just overall, listening to everybody about um, about you know what we're going to do for the future, $3 million and, and what it is. Um, really, in a nutshell, if you look outside today, I mean, we got 70 mile per hour winds. We've got trees down. We've got power losses. Um, you, you we got a lot of catastrophic events that have happened um, weather wise. And back in that Broad Meadows area with the marsh back there, um, there's always um, a threat of having flooding. So, to be very honest with you, uh, time is of the essence for, for that particular school where it's located. And it's, it, you know, we have some issues with weather and we don't know if there's going to be, you know, uh, I feel bad for two years ago when we had the flooding um, of March of 2018. And here we are two years later. And now we have the, uh, the coronavirus uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic out there. But, you know, we can't foresee the, the future of weather. Weather, and we, we don't know what's going to happen. And if we don't mitigate some of the issues at that school um, interior and exterior outside there, we're going to we're going to be in the same situation we were two years ago. And uh, I can remember going down by Post Island Road all the way down um, in Howes Neck, Adam Shore and visiting over in Broad Meadows. It was in bad shape. It was uh, very badly flooded. And I mean, look outside today with with what what the weather is is in is intact. So um, I think it's important that we look at the and foresee the future economically for ourselves, but we also don't want to be putting more money and funding into Mar Broad Meadows if we have an opportunity to fix it now. So um, I'm, I'm happy to hear everybody else out. Um, you make good points on everything, um, but I, I feel that if we don't do it now, we could we could run into an issue with with the weather and be flooded again down down in that cellar area. So. Uh, I wouldn't want to see that happen. And then we would be back to square one as we were in 18, trying to figure out where we're going to get funding to, to, to put in there. So um, this is phase one. Uh, Mr. Hines, if I could through you to Mr. Hines. So phase two and three, is that about $8 million? Is that what you're foreseeing or no? At this point, the forecast that was done is the totality of all the phases is the $18 million. Okay. On the HVAC project. 
Uh, this three million comes off of that. So you're, you're talking five, five and a half million when you get to those later phases in total. Let me ask you this. If we were to do phase one right now, could you foresee bypassing two and three or you do you need two and three? They, that's a conversation for them, but they are not as critical as is this phase one. This, this phase one, the boiler room and the electric system is absolute. It cannot not be done. The other things, yeah, if you want to forgo them, they could, you could skip doing them. Um, but then you've got, you still have old systems and new systems. You don't have the energy efficiencies. One of the things that we're doing is this project's triggering our requirement to come up and meet today's building codes. Um, okay. Get those aspects. So we could avoid having to do the, the HVAC improvements in phase two and three, but we would still have to do the code upgrades and those things. So it's not an absolute yes or no, but you could you could cast off a lot of the added project in phase two and phase three should down the road when funding is requested that be necessary. Well, let's take it a step further on phase two and phase three and a little bit on what Councillor um, Phelan spoke about. Would any of the other phases go under the criteria of the MSBA program of reimbursement or does none of it do? Uh, none of it does. The MSBA, okay. the accelerated repair projects only does roofs, windows and doors and boiler rooms. Okay. Um, this is an interior project they would only, if anything, put towards the boiler room. Um, there's another step further for another question. Do you foresee any stimulus packages um, for any type of schools based on what has been happening with the pandemic that's going on right now? Do you foresee a fund that we could go into and maybe Council McCarthy, our chairman, could elaborate a little bit on that? Do you foresee any of that funding coming in for us? I, I do know that I do know that the package was already packaged, uh, passed, excuse me, has monies for infrastructure and those things. I don't know if the interior of this building qualifies. I frankly haven't read that thousands of pages. Um, I know Mr. Mason did read it. Uh, and being in the finance end of it, I wouldn't presume to speak for him. He may have better information on that than I. Uh, yeah, if it's okay with you, Council, I'll jump in on that. Um, so under Title V of the CARES Act, um, which is the Coronavirus Release, the Relief Fund, that is of the act that most closely relates to the operations of local government, this would not be a permissible expense. So there is currently legislation uh, that seems to be brewing on uh, Capitol Hill that would deal with um, about a $2 trillion stimulus package. Uh, you know, that's very early in the process. Um, that seems to be more horizontal infrastructure. Uh, but some of the think tanks down in the D.C. area do think there will be a substantial vertical comp uh, uh, component to it. But it's still very far. To, uh, we're still pretty far out to make any estimates on that. Thank you, Mr. Mason. The only reason why I ask is I think we're as a body, we're going to have to get a little bit more creative on how we find funding. And maybe that'll be for you, Mr. Hines, that maybe if there's a punch list, that maybe there's some criteria under that stimulus package that 4C comes out, that, hey, listen, we might be able to get some funding for this that we've been pushing out and pushing out that we can't do. So it's just something to be thinking about as a municipality on how we're going to foresee the future and how do we get projects done that have kind of been pushed off to the side. I agree. Absolutely. We will uh, be watching. You. What's that? And we will be watching for that, believe me. Yes, I know you, and you're real good at it, Mr. Hines. Um, <laughs> I already tried me. in this one. They, I asked, they <laughs> told me no. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's it for me. Um, thank hey, you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. And I'm glad the lights are on. You bet. Um, with that, I'd like to go to Mr. Harris, and then I want to go back. I think uh, Councillor Kroll uh, had another, uh, another question, but Councillor Harris, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman McCarthy. Um, you know, obviously, this is uh, something from uh, in, in for Ward 1. Um, and uh, I'm glad I'm glad right now we're not in that position with with the Squantum schools or any of the schools right now in um, Ward 6, you having to deal with it. But hearing from uh, Commissioner Hines, this this really sounds like a project that absolutely must be done. And, and done in a timely manner. We simply uh, we can't have a school building go offline with its <laughs> with its internal systems. This really isn't an option. You know, we we have folks. We're talking about the situation we're in today. I can't even imagine 
the folks in in Ward One that their children go to that school would have to what they're putting up with right now with having to find a place and the time it would take and children not being in school. It, I mean, so critically, if something happened next year during the during the, the storm seasons, I think that I think that it would be negligent on a, on our part not to move forward. But I do have a question um, for um, Mr. Hines. Um, um, Paul, what what happens if we can't get this uh, project done in a timely fashion? The in, in undertaking the work, the abatement in the classroom spaces and the, <coughs> the installation of the electrical system uh, would be advanced ahead of the boiler room construction. Uh, the boiler room construction, uh, much like our MSBA programs, we just did the four schools, we did Wallace and Adlin Howe and uh, Beachwood and uh, I think Marymount. Um, that construction, the inside the boiler room construction can carry into the school year, uh, installing the boilers and all that. The, the hazardous work is done when the building is empty of students. The preparation happens, but the installation of the, of the boilers, the installation of the controls and the electronics, and those components, that can happen in those fall months before you need the heating system online. Uh, October 15th is our internal date by which the heat has to be on. So we do have, you know, another four or five weeks come the fall to finish up a punch list inside the boiler room, um, should the need arise. Um, and the hot water aspect of the school, that will be heated um, from the day the school opens if needed. Uh, it's, the, it's the new areas, the gym, the auditorium, the cafeteria, uh, and, and they being isolated area, areas that uh, worst case scenario, we could, we could fashion a temporary heat system um, but that's something we want to avoid. It's added cost. Uh, we prefer to get in, get in early, and get this done. Thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner Hines. Um, I don't know if anybody moved. I know that everybody spoke. Um, did we move, um, Mr. Chairman? Did we? Um, was there a motion? No. Oh, up, we're looking for a motion. Up, I'll put up the motion to approve. Um, Second. Okay, um, motion by Councillor Harris to approve. Do I get a second? Second. Second by Councillor Palmucci. On the motion, uh, Councillor Kroll. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good discussion here amongst my peers. I just want to clarify, I guess, where uh, my perception is. Uh, and Councillor McCarthy, I completely concur with you that this is um, an important project. Like, who doesn't, right? You want to make sure that we have like I said, the basic uh, meat and potatoes in the school. Kids can have heat and air conditioning and, you know, uh, an electrical system that's hopefully not underwater. Um, totally get all that. But again, the original ask last week on April 6th was to come forward with some sort of financial update. Knowing that, knowing that, knowing that, knowing that, there was a lot of variables. Obviously, that's not here this evening. Um, again, in further discussions, we meet again in two weeks. I would say at that point, that's a three weeks to put together a presentation on a financial forecast. All I'm looking to do is understand where we are, what the thought process is in terms of prioritization for projects going forward, that we don't feel unintended consequences uh, with additional borrowing. This is a A1 top priority project. I completely understand that. Just, I'm having a tough time um, understanding why, uh, you know, the vacant right now. Children are not going back to school until May 4th, possibly till next school year. What the harm is in two weeks, but to have this discussion after we have some sort of presentation. I'm struggling to understand that. I know that was my ask. There were many people that supported that uh, sort of initiative to get an update. It's obviously not happening, but I just want to go on the record. That's what I was looking to accomplish before we get into eventually authorizing, you know, four and a half million dollar bonds. So that's that's my piece. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, Counselor. Uh, Chair recognizes uh, Mrs. Mahoney. Thank you. Um, I'd like to actually ask Mr. Hines if we were to if we were to push this vote until May fourth, what would that do to your schedule? I mean, you just got done telling us that we um, we have until October fifteenth to get the work done. So we're talking about two weeks, and um, we had this before us in February, and we knew that this was a problem for two years. So before it came before us in February, we had a problem for two years. So for two years, we sat on this with this major issue. And then from February until now, it's come before us. And now we can't stop the vote from happening because we can't wait two weeks. So I'm wondering, what's the harm in two weeks? With all due respect, I take exception to that. Uh, we have not sat on it for two years. Um, we got funding in place from the council and got a design firm that we had to procure and then get the designs done so that we could come up with a concrete number and this phase and the scope of this project to come to the council for funding. Uh, that came that's, in February, right? So but it came it, in February. It came in in February, correct. Uh, and for my own failure, I didn't push send on an email to share with Councilor McCarthy materials that he was looking for for the meeting back in February. Um, so that was completely on me, my oversight. It was in my draft folders box. So not having information, Councilor, so it uh, McCarthy asked for. I, 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 I understand. I'm going to interrupt. So I understand that you that that, that uh, you had funding and you got the you got the the um, you did work since then. So I appreciate that. But it came in in February and you did not send it over to him until now. So now I'm asking with the fact that we're in a pandemic and it's something that we haven't had in the country since 1918. However, the whole city and the state and the country is in this. What is the harm of waiting two weeks? Two weeks, because I, could, I happen Chairman. to know I happen to know that there are plenty of projects that we say yes to that don't actually go off on schedule, and we are being told that these are imperative that we have to do this today, and yet they don't stay on schedule either. So I'm curious to know why can't we wait two weeks to have that financial presentation and have that vote then? Mr. Walker, would you Mr. like to Chairman, speak? Yeah. As I mentioned earlier. We don't know that we're going to be in front of this body with the financial presentation showing where we're at and what needs to happen going forward on May 4th. That was the basis of my original comments, that regardless of where we are, and as we methodically go through this and figure out exactly where we are, that the two things are not on a parallel track, that regardless of the city's financial position, come that time when we're ready to develop a plan and share with this body what exactly that is, um, come that time. This is the two things aren't related because we need to do this anyways. So, Mr. It's going Walker, to happen. Mr. Walker, with all due respect, are you saying that when, until you have a presentation already and available for us, anything that comes before us will be having the same conversation that these are our priorities? So there could be something else that's a priority. No. And you're saying you don't know what that is, but we don't know either. You could be bringing something else in. And you're asking for funding for things. And we're asking for a forecast. And it doesn't have to have the state of the federal. We just would have to know where we stand as a city today on all the projects that we have and what can it's we not put on just, hold. It's what not can just we put on hold? Are there any projects that we're doing in the city today that we can put on hold? Mrs. Mahoney, let Mr. Walker answer one of your questions you've asked in the last five seconds. Well, just one. Let him answer one. Go ahead. Mr. Asking Walker. to put projects on hold that are already contracted and in process is probably a legal question. I don't think we can do that, nor would I think we would want to do that. All I'm saying, all I have said, is that regardless of the city's financial position, come the 1st of May, the middle of May, the end of May, when we're in a position to actually have some facts to, to discuss, that, that these two things are not a parallel track. That this project, regardless of the city's financial position, if, God forbid, we have to do some sort of major action to stabilize the city's finances, which, by the way, I don't think, we don't think at this point, um, that's probably where we're going to be. But if we had to, this project still has to go forward. We can't close a school. And whether it's two weeks from now, three weeks from now, four weeks from now, this project is not tied to the city's financial forecast for the operating budget of the city. This budget will be. And that's, and that's, and that's why it's before you now. This, this budget dealing, will be tied to the forecast of the future of the city because we'll be bonding it. And those bonds do. Regardless of 
where we are as a city. It's this project a consideration. This, so this project I just needs to I happen. just feel very strongly that we have to be very cautious about how we're moving forward. And we are being very cautious. We understand that, Councillor. That's why we're taking a cautious approach to everything we're doing right now. We're being methodical about it. I'm not sitting here tonight with an overly pessimistic report. I'm not sitting here with an overly optimistic report. We're going to wait until we have our arms around the situation. We have the benefit of some time to deal with that. And we're going to provide this council with all of the inf pertinent information at the time where we're, our team, our financial advisors, and everyone else that's been involved has a firm handle on what we're facing. We don't know what we're facing yet. We don't have any sense of what property tax revenue is gonna look like at this point. We don't have any sense from the state what their revenue projections are gonna look like. We don't know what the federal stimulus is going to be doing for us. We don't know at this point. It's too early, we're in the middle of this. But barring all of that being said, this project, regardless, even if everything I just mentioned comes out in the worst case scenario, we can't not do this project. And again, I would ask, what would be the harm in waiting two weeks? If you're going to tell me in two weeks time that you don't have it and we're in the same spot, you can take the vote then. But in two weeks, that will give you three weeks to be able to just do an assessment, a simple assessment. And you can come back and potentially have the same thing. But really, realistically, we're bringing something before the council in the middle of this. And you're saying that the one and only presentation that you're having, that you have to have a vote on it tonight. You can't wait two weeks. You can't even pretend that there is something that you have to come back with. Are there any, do you have any concerns? I do find that to be very difficult to understand. Um, Council Palmucci, did you want to, did I see a hand up? Yeah, I did. I just wanted to, uh, uh, as we're nearing an end. Can I just ask uh, one question? Council Palmucci, uh, I guess as we're, as, as we're, yes, as, go ahead, as we're, Council Palmucci, I'll come back. Yeah, as, as we're hopefully nearing the end of the, the debate, I think everyone's opinions have been made known. Um, I just, it, the discussion that we're having really um, made, reminded me of the Chinese proverb of the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. What we're talking about is something that will prevent future problems. So whether or not we do it today or in two weeks, when the funding isn't coming out of the general budget, I personally don't see how this could be negatively, um, uh, how this could be, have a negative financial impact on us when we're talking about a project that'll be bonded out over many, many years, not in the short term. With the city, we're not talking about having to make mid-year cuts uh, in, in this budget. We're not talking, of, uh, you know, in our current budget because of the pandemic, we're not talking about uh, we haven't received any information that uh, things are going to be dire uh, in the next fiscal budget. Uh, I think perhaps there, there might be some tightening of the belt. There might be some projects that get put off in the future, uh, which may have to happen. Happens, you know, in, in every situation where um, revenue is down. Uh, I've been through this at least one occasion when I first came on the council. We were in a retraction or a contraction uh, state of, of government where we were cutting positions rather than um, adding positions and then we slowly added them back uh, and we might be going through it's a cyclical uh, cyclical process we might be going through that again in the near future um, however at this point I'm not willing to wait me personally I'm not willing to wait another two weeks uh, to vote on this I'm going to vote on it today I'm going to vote on it two weeks from now and I would have voted on it two weeks ago uh, this is something that can't be put off like, just plain and simple it can't be it, it can't be delayed to the point where our inaction causes us to not have a school to send, um, you know, hundreds of, of children. So for that reason, um, I think we should plant the tree today and I'll be supporting this and hopefully we'll be voting on this sometime. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Councilor Palmucci. Councilor Mahoney, we'll, we'll hit you one more time and then we'll take a vote. What I was just going to ask is um, through, through you to um, Mr. Walker, or to Susan O'Connor, what's left in free cash out of curiosity? Sue? Oh. Sue, you're muted. Sue, no, you're not on. Can't hear her, right? 
I can't the hear. The fact that Chris Walker isn't answering, we just we'll we'll, we'll all take because he doesn't know, right? We're waiting for Sue. <laughs> Maybe better than an answer. <laughs> I think she's saying two million. So there's two million left in free cash. Is that something that we looked at in regards to this rather than bonding at this point? Because bonding means um, essentially, no matter how we look at it, bonding is an impact to our tax base. I'm just curious if there was any other way of looking at how we could go about this emergency project that we need to have done and funded tonight. I'm just wondering. We've we've established that the asset at the MSBA, the the, 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 small, the school school building authority, is something that we can't go to. I'm asking is, is there any other way that we can fund this project other than to bond it? No. Thank you. And Mr. McCarthy, more. if I just, I just I might, count, count yeah, so just, you. I just might add, I mean, I think that as most businesses are learning and most governments will learn and most families are understanding right now, cash is king. Keep that cash for when you really need it. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, that's that's just all I have to say about that. I agree. I was just curious to know if they even thought to think about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, we got a motion by Councilor Harris, second by uh, Councilor Balmucci. Uh, this is for 2020-47, the appropriation of $3 million, Broad Meadows Middle School Phase 1, Coastal Vulnerability Protection and Building Improvements. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you call a roll? Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Present. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. No. Councilor Palmucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Seven members of passes. Thank you. Thank you, members. And, and thanks to everyone, too. It, it was a good deliberation. And, um, Great points are made all around. Uh, the number, uh, the second uh, item, uh, 2020 070, appropriation of 680000 from sewer and drainage rehab fund for upgrades and repairs to Tygate drainage collection system in Beachwood Knoll, school area, Fedo and Sims Road. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Councilor Phelan, for a few comments first, and then um, we'll have. Uh, Mr. Grazioso say a few things about uh, this appropriation. Chuck? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you to the rest of the council, uh, this this is an appropriation for, for a sewer and drainage, re, from the sewer drainage rehab fund. It's for ty, to repair and upgrades of tie gates down by uh, Beachwood Knoll School over where the apartment buildings are. This affects several several homes in the area on Perry, Sims Road, uh, Beachwood Knoll School, Thorn Street, all the way up to Waterston Ave. It's really a uh, important thing so to keep these people from getting flooded, and it helps. Uh, and it it was something when we were doing work down there. The DPW was doing work, found that it was something that was needed. The tie gate was there years ago and is in need of upgrade and repair. And also, this controls a lot of the flooding that happens in this area. Like I said, all the way up to Waterston Ave, <coughs> Mount Fennel Street. So there are several several homes that are involved in this, not to mention the school and a rather large apartment building. So the money is coming out of the sewer rehab fund. The sewer rehab fund is money that comes in from developers that can be used to uh, that's there to improve the sewer and drainage around the city. And this is exactly what it's going to be doing. And uh, so I would just ask my colleagues, this isn't coming out of the regular tax revenue or anything. This is money that's already in place and it's fees that have been collected from developers. So it's money that we already have that can only be used for this. And I asked my, I asked my fellow counselors to consider a vote for this tonight. It's something we'd like to get done as soon as possible because there is a, it could be flooding in the area. And that's why, why we're, we're pushing it forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. And uh, if I could uh, uh, have the Commissioner of Public Works just talk a little bit about this and what needs to be done. I know that Councillor Phelan covered a lot of it, but I'd like to hear from Al. And then um, I'll go to my colleagues for any questions they have. Mr. Grazioso? 
Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Good evening. Good evening, counselors. Um, so Sims Road was scheduled for resurfacing. Um, when we took a look at the infrastructure, um, it was determined that um, a considerable considerable drainage improvements needed to be done in the area. Um, we looked at several alternatives, how to expand the drainage system, uh, which is fully controlled by the tide gate behind Beachwood Knoll School on Langley Circle side. We also reviewed the water mains in the area and the sewage <laughs> uh, pipes, which are on piles. Um, so we came up with working with wood and a current, um, what we want to do with this money, which we would expand the drainage down Sims Road, and in catch basins to collect runoff, and we lay uh, larger, um, more direct pipes from Sims across Fennel Street to the tide gate uh, to eliminate some misaligned 1939 pipes. Um, there's also a considerable amount of work that needs to be done to that tide gate. That will also be performed. Um, the transfer also includes hydraulic modeling of the area. Uh, and will expand the stormwater modeling uh, being done in the Blacks Creek area, Fennel Street area, uh, and it will help uh, in the Ebbets Ave, Watterson, Wendell Ave, East to Nazarene area, uh, which has its stormwater flows through the same exact tide gate. Um, so this is a, it's, it's a pretty large project, um, but again, like Councilor Phelan said, this money is being taken out of the uh, sewer drainage rehab account, which was set up for these type of projects. Thank you, Commissioner. Any questions from my colleagues? Councilor DeBona? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councilor Phelan and uh, uh, Commissioner Gracioso for putting this forward tonight. I've uh, continuously got a lot of requests for work to be done in that entire area every time I walk it. Um, been through a few elections and a lot of different folks have told me, Councillor, when are you going to get some work done in this area? And we're constantly trying to get the proper funding for it. So this is an important project. I'm glad it's in front of us today. Um, the weather conditions are unbelievable. The tide gates, I know Councillor McCarthy just spoke about some tide gates not functioning correctly over the weekend, or last weekend, and we had some flooding in the neck. Um, we just need to make sure we mitigate this, this, um, these type of issues and the, the water, it, it goes into, you'd be surprised where that water will, uh, bleed to and, and go to. I know that some of the areas back there that you guys are talking about, obviously, as well as Copley, um, it's receding up on, into people's backyards. Um, this wasn't the issue 20 and 30 years ago, but, uh, the water is like uh, almost like the bathtub effect is 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 stay, is is being stuck in certain areas and coming up onto people's properties. So I'm happy to support this tonight, and I'm happy and I'm glad that it's in front of us because this is an issue that needs to be mitigated as soon as uh, as soon as possible. So it's just a comment. I I'm glad it's in front of us, and I'll be voting yes on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, do I anyone else have a question? Mrs. Mahoney. Um, just out of curiosity, how much money do we have in that account? I believe 4.3 million. 4.3, and what other what other projects do we have scheduled or do we have any scheduled other than this particular project? Uh, nothing else scheduled to be used out of that fund at this moment. At this moment? No. And um, how, you know, as we, as you're, building up that fund, how fast do you build up that money just out of curiosity? That fund is um, is funded through development. I believe there's a, um, Sue can answer, or uh, Eric can answer, there's a 1% fee, I believe, uh, to developments, um, any development that comes in the city. And I'm not sure if it's over four family or whatever they, what, but all developments fund that fund. Yeah. Is Mr. Mason going to answer that question? Or yes, we... I confirm that, yes. Okay, you're confirming it's 1% of all development? I believe so, yes. I'll check the statute unless Sue, do you, do you know? If... 
she's muted. It's okay. So, th so we'll have about three million dollars left after this. Well, you'll have a, you'll have about four point seven if I if I look at it correct. I oh, mean I three point three, was... three point three point seven, I believe. Doing quick math in my head, three point three point seven, 7 will be left. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Palmucci, did you have a question? Or were you just waving to me? Uh, no question. Okay. Uh, Make a motion, Mr. Chairman. Second. Yeah, there's a motion on the floor by Councilor Phelan. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Councilor Palmucci. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that concludes the finance committee meeting. I want to thank everyone uh, really uh, on both both counts. Um, the Broadmeadows one um, is a tough one, but life has to continue um, cautiously. And I know that the mayor and Mr. Walker and I have had multiple conversations um, about different things and um, to jeopardize a, um, a middle school um, when we have um, the time to prepare it, knowing that it did take a, um, a really bad hit two years ago. Uh, it, it's a good thing. So um, I want to thank everybody. And with that, I'll adjourn from the finance committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so we are going to uh, get right back into the Monday, April 13th meeting of the City Council. Um, Madam Clerk, first item on the agenda, please. First item is 2020-072, Ordinance Change in Zoning Classification of 162 Old Colony Ave. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Councilor Phelan. Thank you, Madam President. Um, this 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 zoning change I, I've discussed with the mayor's office. It's uh, it was put in originally by me back in the 1990s. It was about um, worrying about overdevelopment in that area, and then it was bought by East Nazarene. They've sold part of it now to the city, and all that's left there is the Kinder Care, which is under the which was under the the PUD classification, but it doesn't have the the space and what it needs to anymore. And so, um, so, so this matter, um, they want to move it to business B and I would, uh, and, and haven't looked at the area really just talking about where the kinder care is now. It's not a big, huge indu former industrial parcel, which this was. So it makes sense to, uh, change it where the city's going to be coming in doing, doing, uh, school work in that building. So, uh, it makes sense to change. Thank you, Council. Do I have a motion? I make a motion. To put into your committee or to. It needs to be advertised. Yeah. yeah. Council, can you just confirm what your motion is? Uh, my motion would be to put into ordinance committee. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council McCarthy, you're going to second that? Yes. Great. Thank you. So we have a motion to move this into ordinance with a second by Council McCarthy. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the ayes have it. Madam Clerk, next item on the agenda, please. Next item is number two, 2020-073, gift of $500 from various donors for, from DEA. Thank you. Council McCarthy? Yeah, motion to accept and to send a uh, uh, letter of thanks um, from the very, to the various donors. Thank Second. You. Thank you. I have a motion to approve by Council McCarthy, second by Council DeBona. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Council Kane. Yes. Council Kroll. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. Council Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Nine members. Thank yeah. you. Next item on the agenda, please. Number three, 2020-074, resolve and update on the Fox Rock LDA. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and wave the rest of that reading. Council Mahoney. 
Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, this is a resolve um, brought to you by myself and uh, by Councillor Palmucci, and it's we're just looking for an update to the Fox Rock LDA for the downtown. The approved, and um, there were certain steps that we need to um, accomplish in that year. And what we're asking for is that um, we have a presentation in regards to the development from the city of Quincy and also from um, Fox Rock back to the city council to give us an update on that. And then if they have any status or updates in regards to any of the impacts they're having with um, any of the con con current considerations that we're having now. But we do have some landmarks that we should have um, reached, and we're looking for that update. Um, if we could have that moved into oversight and also the downtown, those are the two areas I'd move it into. Okay, so we have a motion to move this into oversight and downtown. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilor Um Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. Yes. Council Phelan. <laughs> yes. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Nine members. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move that into committee. Um, so next we're going to move on to the approval of previous meeting minutes. We do have three sets of minutes that we have to approve um, on their own. So first, I'd like to um, entertain a motion to approve the March 9th meeting minutes. Motion to approve. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Second by Councilor Phelan. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so March 9th meeting's passed. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to the March 20th meeting minutes. If I could have a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Councilor Phelan. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Council McCarthy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so March 20th passed. And then last but not least, the April 6th meeting minutes. Could I have a motion to approve, please? Motion, motion to approve. approve. Motion to approve by Councillor Phelan. Do we have a second? Yes. Second. Okay. Second by Council McCarthy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Communications and reports from the mayor, other city officers, and city boards. I do have a um, couple of communications this evening. Uh, traffic requests to refer to Ordinance Committee for Advertising. Uh, board two, add no parking on the south side of Edward Street, Washington Street to Union Street. Add no parking on the south side of Edward Street, Union Street to 185 feet southeast of Union Street. Add a no parking on the southwest side of Edward Street, 315 feet southwest of Union Street and 640 feet southwest of Union Street. Add no parking on the north side of East of Edward Street. 185 feet southeast of Union Street into 315 feet southeast of Union Street. Those will all be referred to Ordinance Committee for advertising. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and put those traffics into Ordinance. Are there any other communications and reports? Okay, so then we'll go ahead and move on. Unfinished business from preceding meeting. Okay, seeing none, reports oh, of committee. I had some traffic. Was I supposed to do it in committee? Oh, you can do it now in reports of committees. So okay. do you want to go ahead and go first? Sure. All right, Council Mahoney. All right, so bear with me because I'm going to be reading off of another computer. So um, the Ordinance Committee has some items that were passed. All of the traffic requests were advertised in the 31920 Quincy Sun. The first one is in Ward 1, 2020-062, and it's to add... Do not enter at Calvin Road and Calvin um, Calvin Road and Calvin Road at 7:30 to 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. to 3:30 p.m. on school days. Um, so we're looking for a positive recommendation for this. Motion to approve. Okay. We have a motion to approve by Council McCarthy. Do we have a second? Second. A second by Council Franklin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Roll call. Any opposed? Do we need a roll call on this? If, Madam Clerk, do we need a roll call on this? Yes. We do. Okay, I apologize. Can you uh, call the roll time, please? Councilor Kane? Yes. Councilor Kroll? Yes. Councilor DeBona? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Councilor Mahoney? Yes. Councilor McCarthy? Yes. Councilor Pelmucci? Yes. 
Council Phelan? Yes. President Liang? Yes. Nine members. Next. We have 2020-063 add two-way stop sign on, um, is it Frederick Street and Adele Road on Bunker Hill Lane. Um, do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilman McCarthy. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Tamucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Nine members. Councilor Mahoney, do you have any others? Oh, sorry, I didn't know it was over. 2020-064, um, add do not enters from 7 a.m. to 10, 10 a.m. at Willow Ave, Anderson Road, Oakland Ave, jo George Road, and Morley Street, intersecting with Furnace Brook Parkway. Motion to approve? Second. Thank you. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. Yes. Council Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Nine okay, members. 2020-065 at Handicap Loading Zone at 42 Willow Ave. Motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Council Kane. Yes. Council Kroll. Yes. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Mahoney. Council Mahoney. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. Yes. Council Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Nine members. 2020-066, okay. add do not enter signs from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. at Cedar Street, Willow Ave, and George Road, intersecting with Newport Ave. Uh, motion to approve. Second. We have a motion to approve. Councilor Phelan. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Pelmucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Nine members. 2020-067, add no parking on north side of Kemper Street, Elm Ave, and Watterson Ave. Motion to approve. Okay. Second. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Can you call the roll, please? Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Pelmucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Nine members. And the last one, 2020-068, add two-hour parking parking on south, south side of Kemper Street, Elm Ave, and Waterston Ave. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, we have a second. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Council Kane. Yes. Council Kroll. Yes. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. <clears throat> yes. Council Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Nine members. I'll get better at this next time. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Um, any other reports of committees? Finance. All right, Council McCarthy, do you have any reports from finance? Yes. Um, I'd like to bring uh, both items forward for a vote. Uh, I'd like to make a motion, 2020-047, the appropriation of $3 million for the Broad Meadows Middle School Phase One Coastal Vulnerability Protection and Building Improvement, put that in the form of a motion. Okay, thank you. Do you have a second? Second by Bill, Bill Harris. Thank you, Councilor Harris. We have a second by Councilor Harris. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Present. <clears throat> Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. No. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. Yes. 
Councilor Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Seven members passes. Thank you. Um, second, 2020-070, the appropriation of 680,000 from the sewer and drainage fund for repairs and upgrades to the tie gate and drainage collection system in Beachwood Knoll School area, Fennel Street area, and Sims Road area. And I put that in the form of a motion. Okay, Second. Second by Councillor Phelan. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Councillor Kane. Yes. Councillor Kroll. Yes. Councillor DeBona. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Mahoney. Yes. Councillor McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. Yes. Council Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Nine members. Passes. Thank you, motion passes. Council McCarthy, do you have anything else to report out of finance? No, I'm also, but thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so moving forward, we've got a presentation of petitions, memorials, and remonstrance. Uh, Council Pamucci. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, if you'll permit my indulgence here, um, I just want to take a moment to reflect upon um, some observations I've made um, during this pandemic, uh, particularly about the strength and the character um, of our city, uh, its employees, its residents, its business community, uh, the character and, and strength that everyone's shown throughout this. It's really been tremendous. Um, there aren't many silver linings to find during this pandemic. But the resiliency of our city, I think, uh, certainly is one from the public health department uh, working around the clock to assist people who are sick uh, and to keep residents informed and up to date with information about this uh, to our first responders who are out there on the front lines every day uh, showing up to work, willing to serve, uh, putting themselves and their families uh, in harm's way to do so. Uh, the many healthcare professionals who work in regional hospitals, but call people home, um, who continue to help despite a lack of personal protection equipment for themselves, to protect themselves. They're still showing up to work every day. Uh, also our city employees, uh, like our sewer and water folks, uh, the, the guys out there today, cleaning up trees that are falling down. Uh, they're out there every day still serving the city and serving the residents of the city. Our business community has really stepped up with everything from offering free meals uh, to overseeing the city's housing assistance program, uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the residents who have donated money and, and volunteered at our city's food banks, who are in desperate need to meet this unprecedented demand that they're seeing. Uh, our social service groups like QCAP, Interfaith, uh, and the YMCA, who YMCA helping with the city's efforts uh, with Father Bills to um, care for and house some of the most vulnerable uh, folks and the vulnerable populations in all of this. And really, I could go on and on giving examples of the positive character and the positive um, uh, work of, of folks in our city, as there are plenty. Uh, but really, the true measure of the quality of our city can be found in the thousands of interactions that are happening every day in our city. Uh, the neighbors who are checking in on each other, making sure everyone's all right. Uh, sharing and caring for and with each other like we've never had to do before. Uh, never before has a neighbor had to ask if their neighbor had some toilet paper to spare. Um, these are physically and emotionally trying times, unlike anything any of us have ever seen in our lifetime. And I'm really proud. I really am. I'm proud of how our city has responded and how we're showing our true nature. Um, this all this all kind of came into to, to sharp focus for me on Saturday afternoon uh, when I was sitting in, a, in a, a lawn chair at the end of my driveway with my wife and my two kids, one of which one of which was trying to celebrate her seventh birthday. As we waited for family and friends to drive by in their cars and beat their horns and wave to Violet for her birthday celebration because this is the best we could give her under these circumstances. Um, there were so many strangers who stopped to wish her a happy birthday. People we'd never met before, not our neighbors, nobody we'd ever seen before. They beeped, they waved, and they shared as much joy with her as our family and our friends did. 
I'm, I'm getting emotional just talking about it because it, it made me emotional when it happened. Um, this exchange of, of even simple pleasantries, they're happening more and more now in this time of crisis. That was an amazing thing for me to see on Saturday and to be a part of. And I think, you know, life may never be the same when we come out of the other end of this. And we will. We'll come out. We'll come out better. But I believe that we'll be stronger and closer and more connected with each other. And I've never been more proud of our city than I have been during the duration of this pandemic. So I just wanted to thank you, Madam President, um, for allowing me, uh, again, the indulgence. And I, and I want to thank everyone. I want to thank everyone for the job that they're doing. Um, I'm just so proud to be a part of this community, and I'm so proud of everybody in it, for the way they respond to this. Thank you. Well, thank you, Councilor. That's really well said. And um, I hope that you will wish Violet the biggest happy birthday from every single one of us. And, um, you know, if and when we can see her again, too, then it'd be wonderful if we can all wish her a happy birthday together. But in the meantime, please give her. Um, she said, Dad, it's OK. This party's OK because it's kind of cool. I've never actually had strangers at my birthday party before. And there were a lot of strangers involved today. So she, <laughs> she was happy. Thank you for sharing. Um, does anybody else have uh, any presentations of any petitions, memorials, or remonstrance? I'm just going to do another look around. Um, okay, with that, I, I will just mention if it's okay. Um, I wanted to take a moment, you know, Councillor, when you're talking about, you know, all these folks in the community who come out um, during this time, I got a call from somebody who we've all had the opportunity and pleasure to work with. Um, and, you know, the first thing she said to me was, I'm not feeling too great, but. I wanted to reach out because I wanted to see what it is that we could do to offer our support um, in Quincy, you know, during this time. And um, it's with great sadness uh, to report that unfortunately we then lost her, um, Amelia Finney from the Carpenters. Uh, she was the business representative for um, Local 346. And, uh, you know, that's that's so par for the course for what kind of person she was, right? That like, even when she was down, the only thing she was thinking about is how she and her members and the folks that she worked with and led um, could do more to continue to give back to the community that they served in. And, you know, again, I know that all of us had an opportunity to work with her over the years. Um, I know that we were all touched by her in, in one way or the other with the amount of support that she gave, the information she gave um, to really make sure that, you know, all of our residents who were working and, and were here locally were being taken care of. And she was, you know, the biggest advocate for those kinds of things. And I cannot say enough good things about her. Um, it's, it's incredibly awful and tragic. And I would just ask that we all uh, keep her daughter and, and her family in our thoughts and prayers um, as, as they get through this. So, um, Council McCarthy? Yeah, just uh, briefly, uh, and I know everybody has uh, everyone in their prayers and thoughts during this time, but um, uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention to keep in your prayers and thoughts, Frank and Sandra McCauley. Um, both are in the nursing home here in Quincy, both had tested positive, both are fighting it as true Owls Neck Macaulay people do. Um, and um, hopefully things will turn out for the best. I talked with um, Frank's oldest daughter, Melissa, who I went to elementary school with, and she was very upbeat the last time she sent me a message, which was yesterday. Her mother was doing better and Frank looked like he was doing better. So with all the prayers and thoughts and all the well-wishing to everyone, which I know everyone is all the time, uh, keep those Macaulay's uh, in mind. And if I know them, they'll uh, battle back uh, uh, right back like they, they always do. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you for sharing that. Um, does anybody else have any other presentations of petitions, memorials, or remonstrance? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and move forward. Uh, motions, orders, and resolutions. Okay, seeing none. Scheduling of committee meetings and public hearings. Okay, seeing none, I will just remind folks um, that our next city council meeting, regularly scheduled council meeting, is scheduled for Monday, May 4th. Um, if there are any changes or any updates for things between now and then, um, our incredible team at the City Council Office will make sure to get that out to folks um, 
And with that, I, I do hope that every single one of you are continuing to stay safe. I want to thank all of you again for being on today's call. I think that more and more we're having um, some technical difficulties, which is discouraging. But what is encouraging is um, how patient and um, really present all of you have been throughout these meetings. So I want to thank all of you for that. Um, and do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Take care, everybody. Be safe. Thank you, everyone. Safe. Take care, everybody. Safe. Right. Good night. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.